In this video, I will show you how we can use unit deep learning for cloud segmentation. I take as an example the segmentation of the cell nucleus in an annotated database using the unit architecture. The input images are EGB images of size 256 x 256. And at the output for training, we have the ground trophies, which are binary images with the background in black and the nuclei in white. In this database, we have for training data 530 images and for the test 134 images. So you can download these images and then you can put directly the folders in cloud, in Google, in your Google Drive. To do this directly, you can drag and drop the folders into your Google Drive. I already did this at home and if this is the first time you are using Google Colab services on your Gmail account. So what you need to do first is to install Google Colab on your Gmail by clicking on the new here, more and connect more application. After you search for collaboratory for Google Colab and you can install it directly. For me, it is already installed. Once you have installed the Google Colab, you go into the folders you have even here. Inside, there are the data, images, and binary mask in a zip folder called data. And there is the notebook where there is the code where the unit is, is implemented. Unit segmentations notebook. Click on the notebook. You can see that we have different cells. We can put text, comment, and other cells. We can put the codes. So the first step, connect the notebook to the drive, connect uh, to the hosted runtime environment. Once you have the uh, OK signs here, you go into modified here, and you choose notebook setting to make sure you're going to use the GPU. So there is a list here, known you are using the CPU. In that case, you change into GPU and then you save your choice ONS. Then we can start directly to execute the uh, different cells. I will explain you to you now uh, what we are doing in each cell. So, uh, so for the uh, first cell here, you have different libraries to read the images to implement the different convolutions blocks of UNET. We are going uh, to import these libraries. We launch this cell. After the, se the second step, we uh, give permission to Google Colab to access your drive, to access your data. Then we define the path where the data is located. In my case, the data is in a folder called ESRF seg hands on in your case you put the path of the folder where your data is located then as the data is in the zip folder you have to unzip the folder data so uh, so ls data allows you to see that there are two subfolders nuclei train data for training data and nuclei vol data to look at what's in the nuclei train data folders we write uh, this code to show each subfolder and file Similarly, if we do uh, for nuclear test data, we can see the test data. So here, what we are doing to do, we are going to define an image, visualize the different images that we are going to use. So uh, the first step in deep learning is to visualize the data in order to inspect the data we have. And here we have a function that read images according to an index 
and visualizes the uh, image and the binary mask or the ground truth. The first step here is to define the size of the images. In the function that reads the images, we can resize our images. At the beginning, we have images of uh, 256 by 256 on three channels RGB. We can resize or change the size and then we define the different paths for the training data R and the test data. So here we uh, launch this cell and then we go to the next one. Here we have a function to read the different images in the uh, different folders. So here we are going over uh, each folder in the training and in the test and we are iterating over each image in these folders and reading each of these images, the corresponding uh, mask. We define uh, this function. Then we read the data. We are going to read the training data and put it in the X train images and the binary mask in uh, Y train. In the same way for the test data, we, we will put the images in X test and Y test. This cell will take some time. The next cell will be to see how many uh, test images and training images we have. Here we show uh, the numbers of images that are stored in X train and Y train. The same for X test and Y test. You can see that we have 530 images in X train and Y train. For the test, we have 134 Im images. We have the same number of binary masks for the training and test data. Then we visualize some images using the display function that we have already defined before. We give an index for the images and we display for the index a training image and a test image. You can change the indexes here up to the uh, maximum number of the images in our database. Now we define the unit architecture, two parts structure the architecture, encode and decode. In each part, there are five convolution blocks, one, two, three, four, and five. In each convolution block, there are two convolution layers, a first layer and a second layer. Here, we reduce the size of the images by two in order to highlight the features of the complex and to reduce the calculation time, and so on. For each block, there is a skip connection there is a transfer of the feature map between each block of the encoder and decoder part. What we are going to do, we are going to define the architecture uh, to, the able, to be able to use it for the segmentation of the cell nuclei. As we said, there are several convolution blocks here, five and five. Inside, there are two convolution layers. It will be difficult and complicated to repeat the same code for each convolution layer. What we can do to reduce the uh, repetition of the code, we will define a function where we find two uh, convolution layers. We define a cov 2 block function, which will take as an input the size of the image or the filters. the number of filters and the size of the filter to be used. So here we have a first convolution layer after, followed by an activation layer with the activation function ReLU. We will use this function to generate each block of the architecture. So to define the unit architecture, we define the get unit function. We have encoding a first convolution block followed by a max polling. We have defined this part. C2 is the second convolution block with the convolution layers and the max polling. Block 5 is here. At the, in, at the output, we get 1024 features map.
What we are going to do now, we are going to define the decoder part. We are going to do a transpose for the convolution layers and put a skip connection between the encoder block. For the first layer of the decoder, we uh, do a transpose with the cov2 transpose function, keeping the same number of the filters of the corresponding layer here, uh, C5. Then we concatenate the features map of the output C of the output C4 and U6. So here we are. We uh, concatenate the features map here and the result of the transpose here, and so on, up up to block C9. Block C9. We are in this case. We still have to generate the output of the unit architecture here. So we will use a coalition layer with a single filter of size one by one and a sigboin activation function. Finally, we concatenate the output and the output data docket to get the model. This code cell is used to generate the unit architecture. If uh, we return at the top, the loading of the data in the X train and Y train list is complete. For the test data, the loading is almost complete. When finished, I show you some example. So the loading is finished. I see the number of images 536 for the training data and the growth through the mask. And the test data, we have uh, 134. The test data will be used after the training. The training data will be divided into training and validation data to validate the different iterations of the model. Here, I show you some example of images. The images with uh, an index of 100, for example, or the one with one and so on. So now I'm going to directly use the convolution block functions and the implementation of unit. I finished. I defined this uh, functions to compile the model. Now we will uh, define a function that will be used to evaluate the performance of the segmentation. In segmentation, we use the dice score. The dice score is two times the intersection between the prediction and the growth truth, divided by the sum of the prediction and the growth truth. This cell is used to compile the model. First of all, we give the size of the images at the input, x train shape 1 and x train, x train shape 2, and the three channels, 256 and 256, the three channels. In the second line, we define the model with the image size and four filters. About the filters, we have set the number of filters equal to 4. So 4 times 4 equals 16. So we have 16 filters in the block instead of 64 filters as shown in the uh, graph. In the second block, 32 by 32. The third block, 64 by 64, and so on. We use the model, uh, we uh, compile the model using the Adam algorithm to obtain the optimal weights with a learning rate equal to 0 0.001. This learning rate is important. Indeed, in this graph, we have on the abscissa the number of epoch and on the ordinate the values of the loss function. If the learning rate is too low, then the gradient descent will be small. So the update of the model weight will be very slow. So the training will be very slow. If we have a reasonable le learning rate, we will have a compromise between training result and training time. 
On the other hand, a learning rate that is too high will cause the model to diverge. In our case, we set learning rate equal to 0.001. Depending on the results of the model, we can change In this line, we compile the model by specifying the binary cross-entropy function as the loss function and the dice coefficient metric that we defined above. If we run this cell, we see a summary of the model and the details of our model. At the bottom, we see uh, the number of parameters that will be used to train the model. Here, almost 1 million parameters. Before uh, starting the training, it is interesting to define early stopping. Early stopping allows the model training to be stopped when the quality of the training is reduced. No improvement in weights, no improvement in the loss function. It allows the training to be stopped before the overfitting occurs. Overfitting leads to poor generalization of the model. The other step is the checkpoint. At each iteration, if the model n is better than the model n minus 1, the model is, uh, is, uh, is saved. Otherwise, the model is not saved. In this step, we only save the best model before the overfitting. Here we are the training part. We use the training data to make our training and validation data. The training data will be divided into uh, two parts, one for the training and another for model validation. So I will take 30% of the training data, I mean 30% of the 536 images for validation and the other for training. Here we can see here uh, we can have 375 images Uh, for training and 161 images for validation. In this case, at each iteration, we use 375 images to improve the weights of the model and 161 images to validate these weights. At the output, it will look at the loss function calculated from the validation data and not from the uh, training data. The compiled model is called model. The fit function is used for training. The training data, x train and y train, are given. The validation data, uh, x val and y val. The batch size is the number of images used for each iteration. Here, 5. The epoch number of iterations for uh, updating the model weight. Here, 20. We define the call box where we specify the early stopping and the model check. So we launch the training. At each epoch, we will see the evolution of the loss function at the performance metric. In each epoch, we have 75 steps. This number 75 is defined by the ratio between the number of batch size and the number of training images. At the first epoch, the model is registered via the model checkpoint. At each epoch, the validation loss improves from 0.5 to 0.1. Therefore, the model is saved. Again, the model has been saved again because the weights have improved. During training, you see that the loss function is minimized from the validation data. The performance uh, metric can be seen here. The model will continue training until there is no further improvement in the loss function. Of course, the batch size and epoch are high parameters to be adjusted. If we do not uh, use the Alice Topin and checkpoint regularization methods, we uh, must uh, choose the value of our batch and epoch. In our case, we use the regularization methods 
so we can show a large epoch without uh, risking an overfitting since the early stopping stops the training before the overfitting. We see that the loss values decrease, therefore the model improves. There are only two epochs left. We can visualize our training curves by making a plot figure. We take the model which is result. We take the different metric dice coefficient for the training data and val dice coefficient for the uh, validation data. Similarly, we take loss on the training data and val loss on the validation data. We can visualize them to know if we have obtained an overfitting or a convergence. Here, the model has stopped now. We uh, launch these cells to visualize this curve. We see that the model converges, the train and the validation converge. Similarly, we see the train and validation for the loss converging. Also, the red cross indicates the uh, place where the model has, be, has the smallest uh, loss function value. So, so we will look at the weights of the model with an epoch close to 14. This model has been uh, saved. We will import this model and then evaluate it on the test data. On the test data, we have a test loss of 0 0.08 and a test metric of 0 0.93. These are the results on data that uh, he has never seen. It was not included in the training data or the validation data. As we have applied in model to the test data, we, uh, we will visualize our results. So in the predict function, we will predict our test data. At the output of the unit, uh, we obtain a probability map between 0 and 1. So we will have a step of optimization of the freehold of this probability map. I set a freehold equal to 0 0.8 at random. Then I visualize the result for an image. You see the uh, input LGB image, the ground through, the probability map from unit, and at the end, the segmentation map after the probability freeholding. We can look at another test image. The results are outputs of our training model. Now, how can uh, we optimize the freehold value? The optimization uh, will be done from the validation data, not from the train data, not from the test data. First, I will predict the validation data with our model. Then I use the F1 score metric to determine the optimal segmentation freehold candidates. I determine uh, probability values from 0 to 1 because the probability map is between 0 and 1. Then I apply each probability value on all predicted images. Then I calculate on the images with the freehold of the F1 score. Thus, the freehold that maximizes the F1 score is the optimal segmentation freehold. The cell uh, performs the freeholding optimization. Here, I visualize the optimization curve. We read that the optimal freehold is equal to 0 0.4 for an F1 score of 91. In this cell, I apply the optimized uh, segmentation freehold to the uh, predicted test data. Then I visualize the result before and after the uh, freehold optimization, the input image, the growth proof image, the image with freehold equal to 0 0.8 before op optimization, the final result with uh, freehold optimization. In other image, in another image, we, you can see the difference before and after the freehold optimization. Thank you very much.